in the uh, books that I've written that cover baseball uh, with Nolan Ryan and Bob Uecker and Mickey Mantle, uh, Tommy Lasorda's stories always seem to pop up. Uh, he was a longtime manager of the uh, Dodgers and succeeded Walter Alston. And both of them managed the Dodgers for more than 20, 25 years. Uh, the first time anybody heard about Lasorda was in 1955 when the team was still in Brooklyn. And uh, it was his one big chance to make the major league roster. And uh, the uh, Alston uh, suspended Don Newcomb, the great right-hander who came along right just after Jackie Robinson in Brooklyn. And uh, Newcomb was a mild-mannered guy, although he was a fierce competitor on, on the mound. Uh, for some reason, he refused to pitch batting practice one day, and and Alston suspended him, and that that created an opening in the rotation, and Lasorda got to make his first major league start as a result, and as Lasorda would point out himself, he loved the fact that it was, the date that he made this start was May fifth, nineteen fifty five, five 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 five, <laughs> and. Uh, I'm going to read this direct quote if I can, because uh, this this really uh, illustrates, I think, how colorful in a natural way that Lasorda was talking about himself or talking about the game game uh, uh, baseball. And you know, it's really interesting because I think probably of all the great aspects of the Dodger tradition, certainly since the early 50s, it's been their pitching. They've always had great pitching staffs, uh, you know, going back to uh, uh, Newcomb and uh, the pitchers that he was on the staff with, Koufax and Drysdale. And uh, it was always tough to beat the Dodgers in a series because they were going to throw at least three future Hall of Fame pitchers at you. And uh, probably more than any baseball team uh, since the post-war New York Yankees, uh, the Dodgers had all but automated uh, the idea of good pitching. You know, the, the Dodgers staff with uh, Koufax and Drysdale, people forget that the three and four, third and fourth pitchers in that rotation were guys like Don Sutton, and then Fernando Valenzuela and Oral Hershiser. They just kept coming. It was like they were on an assembly line. Um, all of them were homegrown, meaning they were all signed with the Dodgers. They weren't somebody they traded for or picked up uh, you know, off a waiver wire. And probably more than most organizations, the Dodgers and their coaching staff and uh, around the ball club had a bunch of former pitchers. They, they seem to uh, gravitate to the idea of having pitchers uh, involved in their strategy and their planning. So anyway, in 1955 in May, uh, Walter Alston gave Lasorda his first major league start. And uh, they were playing the Cardinals that night. And uh, Lasorda remembered he walked the first two batters he faced and uh, he was working on the next hitter who was Stan Musial. And uh, he threw a wild pitch and the runner on third base tried to score. And as Lasorda said later, there was no way he was going to score without cutting me in half. And uh, the runner on third was Wally Moon. Wally Moon who also played for the Dodgers as well as the Cardinals. And Wally had been an All-American baseball player at Texas A&M. And he didn't have a lot of power, but when they moved to Los Angeles from Brooklyn, they had a they played in the Coliseum, which had a real short left field fence, but a high, high screen. And Moon developed a technique of kind of turning his hands inside out and he could just pop the ball up and sent it about 250 feet or 275 feet. And that was good enough to get it over that fence. 
and he just he 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 concentrated on that, and he he pioneered that, so that if anybody hit one of those home runs like that of that short left field fence, it was called a moonshot, and, and that was before long before he went to the moon. Uh, Lasorda said that Moon hit him like a truck uh, covering home plate, but he didn't score. And um, it's Tommy tells a story. No, I'm sorry, he did score. The run scores. I strike out Musial. I struck out Rip, Rip Ripolsky. I got out of the inning, and in the dugout later, they noticed my uniform was getting red around the knee, one knee. I'm thinking, I got to make this club. Getting hurt is a mark against you, almost as bad as losing. They got a doctor near the dugout. He looks at the knee and says, son, if you try to pitch on that knee, you may never pitch again. And that that warning didn't bother the short at all. The doctor said, you've been spiked so badly, every tendon and ligament is exposed. So Lasorda says to himself, to hell with that, I got a pitch. I got to make this ball club. The next inning, he started toward the mound, but two other Dodger players who had heard the doctor talking to him uh, intervened and grabbed him by the throat and literally held him down, uh, held him on the ground, hanging onto his throat. Lasorda said, that's how I got taken out. That's how he left the game. And the, the next day, the front office uh, sent him to the minor leagues. So before he left, he decided he needed to have a make a personal appeal to the general manager, who was Buzzy Bevesi. And um, when Lasorda started arguing for staying on the team, Bevesi said, put yourself in my place. Who would you send out? I tell him, hell, you got a kid left-hander on this club who can't even throw a strike. Bevesi said, maybe, but the kid left-hander was paid a bonus to sign. And the rule is that a baby bonus baby has to stick with the big club for two years or you lose him. And uh, the bonus baby who couldn't throw a strike was Sandy Koufax. It hurt 10 times worse than the spiking being shipped out, sort of. But I always said it took the greatest left-hander in history to get me off the Dodgers. But you know, his, his inability to make the ball club as a pitcher uh, influenced him as a manager. And it, it sort of had a, a human dimension to him that a lot of managers didn't have. And uh, he, he didn't go by, often go by the record book if he had a chance to go by the a player's character and what he was in, in his heart. Um, it was always fun to be around Lasorda. He was as interesting and, and as good as an interview as Casey Stengel, but he was a lot easier to understand. Um, interesting enough, uh, Don Sutton uh, was with the Dodgers in the heyday of Walter Alston and was still with the Dodgers when Lasorda became the manager. So he was sort of an expert on Lasorda. And uh, Sutton said about Lasorda, with Tommy, the volume of your argument got louder and louder until it's like two people trying to do, trying to see who can out yell the other without listening. Once Tommy took Sutton out of a game in Pittsburgh when he had a one to nothing lead in the fifth inning. So Sutton went in the clubhouse and he's throwing things around and somebody over, overhears him say in the anger of the moment, if I were one of those sort of bobos, this would never have happened to me. <laughs> it, it was it was one of those sort of bobos Sutton said, it was something I said to the 
trash can while I was flinging a uniform at it. We laughed about it later. Sutton said it took me a while to to uh, it took me a while to, to change myself to fit Tommy's personality. It took me a while, but the last two or three years I played in Los Angeles, we had a tremendous respect for each other. I know Nolan always felt it'd be really hard to dislike somebody like Lasorda. Uh, he had as much personality as Sutton, but uh, but even though uh, sort of had so much in the way of admirers and people that really uh, enjoyed him, uh, he uh, there were quite a few that tried not to like him. Uh, Lasorda was one of those guys that just kind of demanded and, and received so much attention that, uh, you know, people just resented that on the face of it. But um, it was interesting because when Sutton came to Houston, uh, Astros made a deal for him. Um, the story from Los Angeles was he wasn't a real popular player in, in Los Angeles. Of course, there was Koufax and Drysdale ahead of him, and then there was obviously Lasorda. And um, and it wasn't so much that the fans didn't love Don Sutton; it's just that they didn't love him nearly as much as they loved Sandy Koufax or Drysdale or Lasorda. Uh, the fans rarely had any reason to reject Sutton, but. Uh, Surprisingly enough, they did. Uh, you know, more than his record would indicate he deserved. Sutton just had this talent for, you know, saying things that fans didn't like to hear. When things were going badly, he was always talking about being traded away from the Dodgers to another ball club. And of course, that eventually got him to Houston. And he got to Houston, wasn't happy here, and got traded to Milwaukee. Um, one of the big feuds that Sutton had was with Steve Garvey, the great Dodger first baseman. And um, no one ever really knew the actual details of what caused this. The, the whole time they were together in Los Angeles with the Dodgers, they were feuding with each other over one thing or another. And uh, Sutton hinted that their differences existed before they actually clashed in a gay baseball game. And it was over a story that ironically didn't feature either one of them. Uh, Sutton was asked for a quote by a Los Angeles writer for a story about Reggie Smith. He was, and Sutton said something to the effect that Reggie wasn't caught up in all the Madison Avenue image that some people on the team were. And at that time, Garvey and his first wife, Cindy, were appearing prominently on television commercials and newspaper ads. One word led to another, as words often do. And the next thing anyone knew, the picture of the first baseman were rolling around on the, club, on the clubhouse carpet. The clubhouse happened to be in Shea Stadium. And New York is one of the very worst places to be if you're trying to keep a low profile. Sutton refused to comment on the incident, which was a little out of character. Meanwhile, public interest mounted and the two, and the fans chose chose up sides, and mostly they sided with Garvey. At the end of the road trip, Sutton called a press conference and read a statement in which he expressed his regret. He, he ended the statement with a uh, odd and startling declaration. Thank God for Steve Garvey. <laughs> and uh, it was sort of a non sequitur and didn't have anything to do with what he said, but he just wanted to throw that out there to, as a conciliatory thing. I actually was introduced to Autry during uh, the first or second season the Houston was in the National League. They played a spring training game against the 
California Angels, uh, Autry, the team Autry owned and had founded. And they played in Palm Springs and that was their training camp, uh, Palm Springs, California. And uh, I'll never forget, uh, before the game, they had a ceremony and Autry rode out on his great horse uh, champion. And uh, I, I can never forget that because of what happened. Uh, and writing uh, a, a separate story about the ceremonies because it was so colorful and Autry and it had an orchestra. You know, it was pretty wild for a exhibition game. And in my story, I referred to Autry and his famous horse, Trigger. And uh, a week later, I got a postcard from, a, in fact, I got a lot of mail, but I thumbed through it and one stood out because it was a little large square printing. And it was obviously the, the, the writing of a kid. And it, I'll never, I, I have it somewhere, but I, I, I've memorized it, it's not that long. The, the card said, dear sir, boy, are you stupid. Every four-year-old kid or every six-year-old kid knows that Gene Autry's horse is named Champion, Roy Rogers' horse is Trigger. And then he signed it like Joey Jones, age six. So I know he was one of those six-year-olds. And uh, uh, years later, when Autry and I got together to talk about working on his book, I told him that story and he just loved it. And he said, you know, people are always getting the, the horses mixed up. And uh, I was with Autry when he got word the champion had died. And champion had been living a life of ease on Melody Ranch. And uh, he, I, I could hear Gene's end of the conversation. And he was talking to a guy named Boudreau it was from a Cajun from Louisiana who was who managed the ranch. And he needed to tell Gene that uh, Champion had died during the night and let him know that he had done the numbers crunching and knew exactly how much it would cost to have Champion stuffed and mounted so Gene could keep him with him when he went, went on public appearances and special road trips. and. And Autry said, well, Johnny, that's, that's an interesting thought. He said, what's, what's the final price? What did it come to? And Boudreau said, $25,000. And I, I saw the light go out of Autry's eyes and he said, on the phone to Boudreau, he said, Johnny, he said, uh, he said, just take him out and plant him. He had a great life. And that's what they did. Interesting enough, uh, Roy Rogers had trigger stuffed and mounted, but Autry left Champion have a conventional resting place for eternity. Um, he was a funny, funny guy and uh, had a lovely sense of humor and, 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 and a great streak of kindness. But Autry was such a remarkable guy that when he sold his interest in uh, the uh, Golden West Broadcasting Company, he, uh, he included all those marketing rights and he sold it for a, what was in a really huge sum of money, like about six and a half million dollars uh, to Bob Reynolds. And uh, uh, about a year and a half after they made their deal, the mark, stock market crashed and we had one of those periods of you know, boom and bust where the bust wiped out a lot of people's fortunes. And Autry called his lawyer and said for the lawyer to arrange a meeting with Bob Reynolds, that he was gonna give him back part of that contract. He was gonna eliminate the, uh, he was gonna eliminate some penalties that, that uh, Reynolds company had to pay. And he was gonna eliminate or cut in half the percentage that Autry took from the marketing and merchandising of all those little toys and guns. And uh, his lawyer told me the story and said he, he tried like hell to 
talked Gene out of it, and Autry wouldn't hear it. He said, it was a good deal for both of us, and we made the deal, but now it's not, and I need to make it fair for Bob. So uh, Autry's lawyer was just taking his time getting his papers together, but late in the day, about 4 o'clock, he got a frantic call from Bob Reynolds' lawyer, his lawyer for the, for the buyer, and he said, Bob asked me to call and find out if it's true, if Autry's really making these concessions and giving him back all this money. And I think it included was a, a lump sum of cash, maybe a million and three quarters or something. And uh, the lawyer, Autry's lawyer said, yeah, sadly it is true. And he said, well, if you don't mind, he said, can you get over here right away? Because if we don't get this deal done and something happens to Autry tonight, he said, I'm out of a job. And so that's how Autry did his business. You know, he, he, uh, he was an innovative guy, but he wanted to be fair with people and he always was. I mentioned Joe Jamail, so I'm gonna tell you a great story about Jamail. Oh, Joe Jamail, lawyer, my trials and jubilations. And uh, there's a postscript to the book that kind of captures Joe's attitude about the law. He said, this actually happened. It is a snippet from the transcript of a trial involving a wrongful death suit. An attorney for the defendant is questioning the pathologist about an autopsy. Question, do you recognize the person in plaintiff's exhibit eight? Answer, yes, it is Mr. Edgington. Question, do you recall approximately the time you examined the body of Mr. Edgington at the Rose Chapel? Answer, it was in the evening. The autopsy started about 8.30 p.m. Question, and Mr. Edgington was dead at that time? Is that correct? <laughs> Answer, no, you dumbass. He was sitting up on a table wondering why I was doing an autopsy.